Thank you for joining us. Uh, Fridays at 1 is a very special time for us. It gives us exposure to some of the other issues. Uh, Fridays at 1 is an important time for us. It gives us a chance to get together, to savor ideas, to see what's going on in a particular field, and to learn from the creative works of people, who, many of whom are focused here at the new school. Uh, today's program will be introduced by a, a, today's program will be introduced by Ava Vogel, but I wanted to make a few comments. The new school has been the new school has been on the forefront of the arts for almost a hundred years. We have welcomed artists from Martha Graham to Aaron Copeland to Marlon Brando. And they have come here and have shared their ideas with us. Today, we're very lucky to have a young filmmaker and someone from the media, media studies programs here, Deirdre Doyle, who has helped to build the current interest in the documentary. Deirdre's students have been, for a decade or more, creating interesting things in the world of documentary. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Ava Vogel, who is a student at the IRP, and you will be able to get more information on the way out about the IRP program, but Ava will take over for the next part of the program. Hi, welcome to our first Fridays at 1 for this semester. Uh, I hope you picked up the program that it's coming. There will be three more Fridays at 1 uh, this semester. There is at the sign-up desk. So let me just uh, in tell you what will happen today. Uh, first, there will be screening of the movie. It is 30 minutes. We are lucky to have a director of the movie, Ruth Fertig, with us. And after the movie, after 30 minutes of the movie, uh, Professor Boyle, Deirdre Boyle, will uh, give her commentary and start a Q&A section with uh, Ruth, and later it will be open to the public. Um, can you please turn off your uh, cell phone if they are not uh, turned off yet? And uh, I have to tell you, this movie really touched me, and I hope it will touch you also. Thank you. I want to begin by just making a small correction. Um, I am not currently the director of the Graduate Certificate in Documentary Studies. I performed that function for three years, and then they gave me time off for good behavior. <laughs> so my colleague, Deanna Camille, is in that capacity now and doing a wonderful job. And we owe it to her for um, uh, doing some of the promotion for this event. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, I was asked to say something first um, before um, uh, Ruth and I um, engage in a little conversation and then open this up to Q&A. And um, I was thinking, um, I, I've been teaching uh, courses in documentary here at the New School for over 30 years. And last night, um, uh, as, as uh, synchronicity would have it, um, I screened in my class um, Triumph of the Will. And tonight, I'm having a makeup class, so everybody's coming back again to look at films from World War II. And we'll, the last film we'll see will be the very famous uh, film by Alain René, Night and Fog. So this comes for me and for my students right now at a perfect moment. And I wanted to say that perhaps the one good thing that has come out of the Holocaust is an incredible uh, body of beautiful work by filmmakers honoring the suffering and the memory of people who endured and not all of whom survived that terrible time. And there is a 
everybody here in this room, I'm sure, is familiar with the, you know, the benchmark films, Shoah, uh, The Sorrow and the Pity. There, there are a number. Um, Lanzmann, as some of you may know, has yet another film that was shown just, I think, last week at the New York Film Festival. But um, Ruth's film really speaks to a very particular and I think very important part of the uh, creative response to the Holocaust, which is uh, memoirs, um, sometimes cinematic memoirs, but in this case, it's really a collaboration with her grandmother here. Um, and uh, I, I think that these are among some of the most powerful and enduring films because they touch us. They're people like us. It's not, um, it's not the uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the people in power who made the, the uh, terrible decisions, but it's the, it's the ordinary people who um, managed to maintain their dignity in the face of such horror. And uh, I, I'm particularly struck with Yitzko uh, Remembrance because it's a student film. And I very much understand the challenges for young filmmakers to make a first work and make something that has resonance, which I think this film definitely does. And, and I'm going to talk with Ruth a little bit about that. But I have lots of questions for her about um, how she came upon this. So maybe you have these questions, too. So I hope I'll ask some questions for everybody. And then we'll turn this open and then you can ask whatever particular questions you have. So um, Ruth Fertig, I'm really happy to meet you in this context. And um, my first question is, um, how did your grandmother's memoir come to light? Because it was after she died that you found it, right? How did you discover it? Uh, well, I was looking for an idea for my thesis film. And um, Closer to the I, yeah. I had been looking for an idea for my thesis film, and I had been sort of looking outward at um, ideas that were not very personal, and um, and then started thinking about things closer to home, and um, and the idea of what happened to my grandparents during the Holocaust, and the fact that um, I had this all of these unanswered questions about what had happened to them, but it had never really occurred to me to try to find those answers, even though I had gone in search of answers to other stories that ha had very little to do with me. So um, so it, I, at first I thought I'd do a film about um, sort of like the silence in our family and how we didn't talk about it, and I just started asking uh, my parents and my I asked my parents to ask my aunt and uncle for everything that they knew about the story and um, and my aunt and uncle who live in Israel uh, mentioned that there was a memoir so they had known about it but they had never gotten it translated from German <coughs> and um, so when I heard about the memoir I st still didn't know what was in it for um, for a while until we found it because it had been put away and then moved a few times and um, so then we found the memoir and then got it translated. And what did you think when you read it? Well even before I read it I knew I was going to make my documentary um, about my grandparents story and that if there wasn't anything good in the memoir then I'd do like a sort of meta story about the silence and the, um, but when I first started, well, my, my mother did a, um, a very rough translation first and we did that over the phone. And uh, it was amazing because it's the first time that she had any color for me or, you know, that she was um, a person besides being my grandmother. Yeah because she said she had this sense of humor that I didn't realize she had, and it was sort of like dark and dry. And um, there were things she said 
about sex especially that were just like not something I'd expect to hear f from my particular grandmother <laughs> at all. Um, Whose grandmother talks about sex anyway? <laughs> exactly. So it, it made her like a, a person from, you know, her childhood through to, uh, she got to 1950 and then she stopped writing. So she either got sick around that time or, um, or just stopped writing them. But so I was able to sort of get to know the woman my grandmother had been. Which was really great. Sorry, I talk softly. Um, this film, though, is more than just her memoir, because you went to great lengths to both go to the places where these events occurred and also to do additional research, especially archival research, the period uh, images of, of the, you know, the places, Prague, Brno, um, Theresienstadt itself. Could you talk a little bit about the research that went into the making of this film? You're at Yad Vashem, you're at the US Holocaust Museum. Tell us a little about that journey. Well, one of the reasons I decided to do this documentary, whether even before I had the memoir translated and knew whether it would be a good story or not, was just to be able to spend the time getting to know the story. Um, and so uh, I can't remember exactly the order of when things happened, but we got the memoir translated. And at the same time, I was sort of looking into um, archival sources to see um, what visuals there were from Theresienstadt. And uh, there isn't much. There's the propaganda, two propaganda films that were made there, so you can't rely on them as a historical document. And they're Filming um, and photography wasn't allowed there, so the only other thing that I could find was there was a Czech policeman who took some pictures, but they're not interesting or relevant. Um, and then, um, so I was doing online research and sort of corresponding with Yad Vashem and a bunch of places in um, the Czech Republic, and then when I planned the shoot um, to go shoot in uh, Brno and in Theresienstadt. I planned, we went to the Czech Republic and to Israel. And um, during that trip, it was like a week or a week and a half. Um, we went to all the archives and we sort of hit each one up for a day. It was, and I brought my parents because between them we had all the languages we needed, Hebrew and a little bit of German and um, Czech and English. And so we all had different assignments at each archive to just like speed read through things. And, um, and that, that was an amazing process because uh, you're looking for a needle in a haystack and when you find something, it's really, amazing like in um Yad Vashem we found a yearbook that the mothers had made or the the woman of a woman's barrack had made and um it said something there was a page in there that said something like the sunniest time in the ghetto is when um new children are born and this year we had these these women had children and it listed all the children and my aunt was one of them that was like amazing are you named after your aunt Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us a little something about the decision to use animation, which is beautifully done by, is it Jean Stern? Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that. How did you find her? How did you communicate what you were looking for? Why did you put it when you put it in? Because it's very deliberate and effective. Thank you. Uh, well, because there was very little archival, um, and only so much Super 8 that you can use of empty spaces that are supposed to evoke what was there. Um, I had to think about what I'm going to, um, what I'm going to use to to create any sort of visual interest. And um, at some point, I was thinking about Mouse and how Mouse had had done. Um, drawing or animation without 
of a really ser you know a serious topic, the same topic, without it being um, the word that's coming to me is maudlin, but you know what? Without it being distasteful. Mm -hmm. Everyone know mouse? Yeah. Okay. And then I saw this amazing 11-minute short called Silence, which um, is a, a similar story, and they use visual effects in a somewhat similar way that I definitely riffed off of. And, um, and so I was just sort of thinking about, about it, and, um, and then I saw like an episode of This American Life that was, you know, for, they had the TV show for a couple of seasons, and I saw an episode where it had nothing to do, with, it was not at all relevant, but um, they used animation to, someone was telling a story about something that happened in, in the playground, and there was no other way to recreate it but through animation, and I just thought, yeah, of course, I'll just animate it, and I'll just make sure that it's really, um, really appropriate to the tone. And, um, Jean Stern was an MFA student who was a couple years ahead of me and had gone to art school undergrad, and her art's just beautiful. And uh, she hadn't done animation in a film before. She had done stop motion animation. And um, everyone know what stop motion is? It's when you uh, advance frame by frame and create the illusion of movement, and you could do it with with cells, you can do it with, uh, with objects or with people. It's also called pixelation. Yeah, so she did it with puppets and she created this, these beautiful magical worlds. And um, so, uh, so I asked her if she'd do it and she said yes. And um, so what we did is, it's been a long time so going to have to try to remember this, but it was definitely a process and a multi-step process. So first I had my, you know, my audio column of my script and I had to fill in my video column. So I'd fill in where, um, where I was going to use Super 8 or Archival and then I'd fill in animation to come and then I had to go back and figure out what the animation would be. And that was a process where first I, I slugged in things and found that they were all very on the nose, like um, you know that where the animation would be exactly what she's saying they'd be doing, and that doesn't work. It's it's got to move beyond the the audio. Um, so then I got really drunk one night and like tried to. <laughs> get a little outside of myself and um, and do some less on the nose stuff and then I you know that so that was a process and then I got feedback on that and um, at that point Jean and I discussed and she helped me sort of um, come up with ways to make to, to do what I wanted to do in a, in a visually compelling way and then I uh, I gathered sort of images from around the web or um, um, from Theresienstadt of my family to, sh to show her sort of like a style board or a um, vision board. From that, she uh, came up with sketches, character sketches, set sketches, and then and we sort of worked on those till we came up with a style that, you know, we, we both liked. And, um, and then I think we did <laughs> storyboards where we sort of um, mapped out exactly what the, the action of the animation would be. And then from there we moved to an animatic, which is sort of when you um, do key frames of each scene of animation and slug them into your, to your timeline so you can actually see how it, how it looks as it plays in the, in the full piece. And then she started working on the actual animation. Um, and because we didn't have much time, I mean, I think this was all done in a year-long period or maybe like a nine-month period. And animation like this would normally, I wanted it to be hand-drawn and uh, that just couldn't happen. It did for, for a, few, um, a few pieces, but hand-drawn takes forever. So she used um, 
I think paint was the program she used to sort of try to replicate some of the hand-drawn look. And um, again, to help with time, we cut down on the number of frames per second. So, which I, everything that we did with animation was both a matter of u utility and a matter of an aesthetic choice. And we sort of met in the middle with a lot of it. Um, so we had to do, I think it was like 10 frames per second. Oh. Um, maybe even, yeah. And normally in film, there's like 30 frames per second, so, or 24, 24 frames per second. 30 in video. 30 in video, 24 Analog video. So, um, but that stutter, I think, is sort of gives it like, um, again, sort of a homegrown feel and um, a slow um, quality, like stuttery quality to it that I like, so. It's, uh, it's wonderful, it's very effective, and animated documentaries are increasingly um, getting attention, and there are a couple of books now out about it, but I, I don't think it's um, fully reached a wide public, and, and a film like this, I think, really belongs in the forefront of what's being done today. L talk a little bit about the music because I was really struck at the end reading it. I've seen this film now a couple of times, so I don't know whether you caught all of the music was composed at Theresienstadt. So how did you come by the music and choose these particular pieces? Well, that was also really um, a deliberate choice to use uh, music composed by people in Theresienstadt. And um, I just gathered as much of it as I could and listened and um, a lot of it just wasn't right for for the movie but the the pieces that I chose I think there are th three or four mm -hmm. and um, a few of them just sound like they're written by somebody in captivity you know they're just they're they're like a comment on that time and that place and I feel like they really work and one of them um, the one that sounds sort of opera-like, or there's a woman singing, that, without knowing the context, it's sort of overdramatic or overwrought for the piece. Um, and I almost included the lyrics at the end of the film, but I didn't, and that's one of the things I, I sort of wish I had, because it's so significant to me, that particular piece, and that's why I used it. And I'm going to forget exactly the story, but this woman, who wrote it, she was like a, a school teacher or something. She wasn't really a musician, if I'm remembering correctly. And she, in Theresienstadt, she, she took care of the kids in the nursery or something. And um, they all, all those kids got like deported at once. Um, and she wrote them a little lullaby mm. to uh, keep them from being afraid. So that's what it is. Thank you. Um, the other really strong sound presence here um, is uh, the voice of your grandmother, Lisa Lotta. How did you find that person? And what did you tell her? Uh, what kind of direction did you give her? Because her reading of the memoir is absolutely perfect. So that's another thing that was a really... Um uh, serendipitous turn. Um, I put an ad, or I, I sort of spread the word around in, in New York that I wanted to find somebody um, in, in around, you know, like in their 70s or 80s um, with a foreign accent, Eastern European accent, who was a non actor. <clears throat> and, um, and, then I was coming to New York from Austin where I was in school to record the audio. And I lined up a, a few people who might work, but something was off with all of them. Either um, the accent wasn't quite right, it didn't remind me of my grandmother, or the voice was too young. Um, but at a certain point, I just had to come over. And, um, and I think when I was already here, I, I heard from somebody who had heard from somebody who had heard from somebody that I should connect with this woman. And I called her and uh, 
she sounded exactly right on the phone, but she was like busy. She said, oh, just come over and, and meet. So I came over with my audio equipment. She had never read the script. We recorded it on her first reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we did one more just for safety, but mm -hmm. she sort of blew everyone else away. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the fact that she hadn't even, she didn't know what was going to happen, and she still, she just read it perfectly. And um, she has exactly the right accent could, because she's from Brno, and the Brno accent is different from the Prague accent. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is that she said, Fertig, that sounds so familiar. Are you, um, do you know Weigel? And uh, Weigel is her cousin, and he's my grandfather's best friend from Brno. They were like in the same law office together as interns or whatever when you're first starting out. And then um, he escaped to Israel before the war. And when my grandparents went to Israel later, he handled their reparations claim, and he'd like write letters to her mentioning my family. So we had this connection that was just neat. Like it's really nice that it's also a, a significant person doing the reading. How long did it take you to make this film? Well, it was two years, um, but not two years of, you know, 40 hour a week working on it. It was like one semester of thinking about it and doing research and, you know, then one semester of intensive pre-production and production and then a year of um, editing and animation. And the film has gotten around. It's won prizes, the best student documentary Academy Award. It's been at major festivals. You want to say a little something about what, what it has been for you like traveling around with your film? This is not your first time talking to an audience, I'm sure. It's been great. I mean, I didn't expect for it to um, be seen as in as many places or to get as much recognition as it has. So that's really amazing. And it's nice to know that um, that my grandmother's story that was hidden away in an attic somewhere is uh, being told that the silence is being broken, I guess. And if people want a copy of the film, they can get in touch with the... National Center for Jewish Film. That's okay. on their website. So I'm sure you all have some questions that I haven't already asked. So let's turn it op open to you. And I'll just acknowledge hands so that we have a little bit of order. Yes. And there are, I guess there's someone with a microphone will come to you. So wait until the microphone comes. Thank you so much for making this film. I thought it was very moving and uh, very specific about a particular woman at a particular time as well. I happen to be a uh, MFA student at City College, and we just talked about Mouse two nights ago. So all that is very, I was interested in your reference to that. My question is really about how you developed such a nuanced view uh, and presentation of her take on motherhood. I've never seen this particular strain, you know, as she's, she, you, you, you cover her ambivalence, the loss of the first child, how painful that is, the inability to safeguard her child during uh, being in the camp, getting pregnant again. I think to me, the, the, the visual that will stay with me the longest is her walking increasingly pregnant from those offices to the trying to evade the forced abortion. But I was just so interested in that. I'd never seen that before. So where did it come from? How did you develop it? What were your thoughts about it? Well, that, that really comes from her, because that's all in the memoir. And um, that was another thing that, that I didn't realize about my grandmother that she had a very um, ambivalent, her, I don't know how to say, but her relationship with um, my grandfather was a little bit fraught as well as um, her decision about whether or not to try to keep both of those um, babies. And uh, so that was all in the memoir and it was just, 
a matter of how um, nuanced or complex can a 22 minute film get before it becomes too much. And, you know, there, so there were some things I actually took out, some things I left out um, to try to make it a theme, but not a, uh, not so much to not get stuck in the weeds of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I was sort of like an editor. So the memoir was 30 pages, but not all of it was about the Holocaust. Um, and I just sort of, my job, I thought of it as pulling out the pieces that you needed to, to get the exposition in there so that people had the context and knew what was going on. But then um, also the pieces of it that, that, that moved the story along but also sort of um, were where you got to know, were character building, or where you got to know her and, um, and my grandfather. This lady here. I was amazed at how she was able to circumvent all of the rigid rules. I thought, you, you know, you, you just can't do that. She must have been very strong or uh, the rules were maybe not that rigid. That was amazing to me. It, it almost looked like when she was in the hospital that they were kinder to her than I expected with the first baby. And her strength was incredible. And um, did she say anything about that? I mean, it's not typical. Yeah, yeah so, um, well, first of all, she was really, I think of her as really stoic and strong. And I think one of the ways that she stayed really strong was by shutting down all emotion and just soldiering on. But um, so one of the things that I that I sort of cut out to keep things from getting overcomplicated and also because I wasn't quite sure, it's sort of unclear, is um, how much better treatment she got because when her, when uh, my grandfather was deported, um, somehow I think they, in the hospital, she was able to give birth in the hospital as opposed to not in the hospital because there was some confusion and they thought that she was the wife of a non-Jew and so, or, I'm not, and I don't, I never fully understood that, but yeah, but the, but the piece about evading authority, I think it was because at that point the camp's uh, structure was sort of like the end was coming and so they were just focusing on um, deporting every, everyone and the infrastructure was in some ways, I think, falling Perhaps. apart a little bit at that point because it ha she gave birth like was it two months or three months before liberation uh, three, months. three months before liberation so at that point you know you have to think there was a bit of disorder going on and their priorities are to like keep from losing the war as opposed to keep this woman from having a baby this lady here uh, did Michael get to see this film and um, also, oh, um, obviously she had other children because you're a grandchild, right? Um, and I'm wondering, have they seen the film and what has it done you know, in the family in terms of the talk about this? Um, Michel has seen the film. I don't know what he thinks about it. Um, my parents are here, they've seen the film. I think that... Um, you know, films don't change families, so things are the same. They can. Oh, no, they can. Well, Maybe they can, this, but they this didn't this just in supported. This case. Sometimes it can work the other way. <laughs> so, do, do your parents want to speak? No, I just want to say about the, uh, the thing that you had said, the confusion. There was a transport at that time to Terrorism of Mischlinger, of the people who were 
non-Jew, who are married to non-Jews, or uh, the, the policy about what to do about the women who were pregnant wasn't set in stone. <laughs> For so the, that for was those how women. she managed, for yeah. some reason, somehow she got herself into that category. And you know, the people in the hospital, the doctors, they were Jews. This was, it, some of the best people in Europe were in Terrazin. Right. It was a show camp. It was designed to suggest that the Jews were wealthy and they bought a, 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 a spa-like environment. It was a lie, it was the propaganda. But yes, there were extraordinary people there. Oh, and to go back to the musicians, so some of the, these musicians um, in Theresienstadt were, you know, were in symphonies in European cities around the world, and so they continued to make music in Theresienstadt, and one of the things my grandmother says in the memoir is that, um, it's a paradox or an irony that her greatest cultural life was in Theresienstadt because there would be con these clandestine mm -hmm. concerts where she'd get to hear these beautiful musicians. Does it fill you with great pride to have found the memoir, to have read it, and to have gotten to, to know your grandmother and the terrifically dignified person she was? I imagine that would make you so proud. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that I did this and that I, uh, it required a lot of tenacity to acquire that, you know, to get that memoir in my hands, well, not in my hands, but the scan of it, and um, it was a pretty arduous process to make the film, so it makes me really proud to to have finished it and um, to have something that I think um, that I, I think is a, a good record of of her. I'm tempted to say she's her grandmother's daughter, granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> the the genes will tell. <laughs> There's another hand over here. Yes. I was so impressed by your use of silence in the film. Um, and, I, and I think that you got us to reflect that much more because of how silent the film is uh, and not having ambient noise. And I just, I just wanted to express that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it was originally going to be a, some sort of contemplation on the silence in my family, so it seemed right to <laughs> to have a lot of silence. But you also worked with a sound designer too, because while it's silent, it's not fully silent. There's a lot of very interesting sounds that are there in the background, almost inaudible, that support the experience moving through the film. Want to say something about that? Well, when I without sound, I think that um. The experience I've had with this film and um, maybe with some others is that um, when you, before you do the, the sound design or have any music in, you watch it and you're just like, this is, this, is not, this is not working. And then you start laying in sounds and it ties everything together. So the music um, helped a lot, but then there was still there were whole sections where there was no sound. So um, sound design, and we had to get creative with that too, that really helped. Like I went into my mix not knowing what to put underneath the section with the uh, restrictions. Yeah. And I was sort of panicked about it because it was my mix, like I was done the film, um, but knew it needed something. It just didn't play to have nothing there. Dead, dead space dead space. Yeah, so then the, the mixer's like, well, what if we put typing noise? And I was like, brilliant, put in typing noise. So, um, and I think that helps just, get, you know, move you through smoothly. Another hand. Ah, up front. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add something, because the, the movie by Lanceman is about Mermustain, isn't it? Yes. And he was, she, my, my mother-in-law said that he was one of the, he was, a big thing in the Udenrat there. And he was one of the people who was threatening her 
that she had to go get an abortion. And she oh. said they called him Murmuschwein. So. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Claude Lanzmann. Yes, the filmmaker. Um, maybe not quite as noble a figure as we think. Well, isn't that what the, I haven't seen that new documentary, I haven't seen but I think it either. that's what it's about. Yeah. Now we'll all want to go and see it, so it, uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure of the story of the film. I thought, I misunderstood you, I thought you were saying it was Lanzmann who no, was saying, no, 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 my mistake, no, no, no. okay, okay, it's no, the subject of the film yeah. who was, you know, force, trying to force her to have the abortion. Eva. I will just ask, um, any of your training you got in college, did you use it for your jobs? Do you continue doing it? Uh, yeah, well, I'm now, um, I'm the video producer at a nonprofit, um, and I'm making a little side project, uh, documentary side project, so, yes, yeah, still, <laughs> still, <laughs> Are you not going to tell us what you're working on? Well, the, <laughs> so um, for a while I didn't have anything that I was working on and I was um, looking for something, but the, you know, when you work full time, you can't really, if you're going to do a side project, your choices are really limited because you don't want to have another full time job. And so, um, so in thinking about this movie and how satisfying it had been to make it, I thought, well, why don't I just keep looking for stories in my own backyard? So then I thought, I'll do something on my mother. <laughs> um, because my, my grandfather, not this grandfather, but um, my maternal grandfather took a lot of eight millimeter film while they were growing up in Canarsie. And my dad took a lot of Super 8 film while we were growing up in New Jersey. And so I did um, like an oral history kind of thing with my mom about growing up in Canarsie. And now I'm sort of setting it against the 8 millimeter film. And I'm coming up against some of the same questions. Like, is it just going to be film? Or is there going to be archival? Is it, what else is there going to be? Um, so, but that's, it's a very slow process because I'm just doing it when I feel like it. <laughs> I, I want to say something um, and then just to ask you more. It's really rare nowadays to find people actually working in film. Um, it's costly. Um, it's challenging because the world of motion pictures is increasingly gone in the direction of digital media. So maybe you could say something about your sort of tenacity, stubbornness, sounds familiar, in choosing film and working with film throughout this project? Well, I sort of think of myself as an analog person in a digital world. I just don't, <laughs> I just really like film. And um, I've never, I never learned how to cut in a Steenbeck or, you know, I cut with um, Final Cut Pro, which is digital. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really just like, I loved shooting in um, Super 8. I, I love the sort of craftsmanship and the process of it, that it sort of, you have to shoot the film, but you're not sure if it even came out, and then you have to go get it developed, and then the things you thought would be good are not good, but then there are these hidden treasures, and um, so... Yeah, I just like film. I like sort of analog material, media. I think it's time to adjourn, but I want to thank Ruth Fertig and IRP for sponsoring this wonderful event. And thank you for coming, and thank you.